Dena Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschachadesha Tarine Vancha Kaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patita Nam Pavan Hibyo Vaishnavibyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Atvaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So we welcome all the devotees to our ongoing study of uh, Srimad Bhagavatam Canto 3 and we are on chapter number 2 and this is Bhakti Vibhav. Bhav. Alright? Mm. So, did, does anyone remember anything from the last class? Maharaj, we saw the glories of Uddhava. Yes, we heard about the glories of Uddhava. Would you like to tell us some of the glories of Uddhava? I mean, how from, even from his childhood, he would play with the dolls of Krishna on the age of five, even when his mother called. Yes. Would not go. Right. Um, we also saw how, I mean, we also saw the parallels between Uddhava and the like Srila Prabhupada, how his father was always doing worship and Prabhupada would always follow it. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. We also saw how Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saswati Thakur also had the similar uh, uh, lifestyle, yes. one lifestyle of uh, Nitya Siddhas. Yes, the upbringing, right. Yes. Uh -huh. Thank you, Prabhu. And then, after hearing about the glories of Uddhava, then what uh -huh. happened? Uh, Vidra asked the questions and uh, after the Vidra's questions, uh, Uddhava was remembering the Lord and his uh, various pastimes uh, like that, Prabhupada. Yes, which but he was speaking about some particular aspects of the Lord. Anybody? What, what did Uddhava talk about? in relation to Lord Krishna. Yes, anybody? We heard about the Lord's appearance, right? His appearance, how was it compared to? What was the comparison? The sun rising and Yes, right. And the, the Lord performs his pastimes. How often does he perform his pastimes here on this planet? How often does he come? Once in a lifetime of Brahma. Once, Once in a day of Brahma. Once in the day of Brahma, right. Yes. All right. And one more point, yesterday you mentioned Prabhu, that time uh, leaving Krishna's uh, body here is like uh, um, taking away of Sita, Aravana is taking away of Sita, it's like Maya Sita, here also it's like, uh, that is also Krishna Maya, whatever we are seeing, the Krishna body, ashes, everything, whatever we are talking about that, so that you mentioned Prabhu. Yeah, I mentioned that Krishna, when he departed from the world, he just departed from the vision of the devotees and he left a maya form, a replica of his own body was there. And that was what people think was, you know, Krishna's body was burned, cremated and ashes are there and, and so they think 
Krishna was an, an ordinary person and they think he died. They think his birth and his death are like ours. But we should understand the, the, the appearance of Lord Krishna and his disappearance are not at all on the level of the conditioned souls or ordinary people like ourselves. The Lord's appearance was like the sunshine and his disappearance also the sun sets. The sun is not gone, it's just hidden from our vision. So when the Lord departed from the world, it was just that he's no longer visible to us. And, but he bewilders the atheistic people by leaving a, a replica of his own form. So they think, oh, this is Krishna, and he's dead, and we have to burn him, we cremate him. They, they don't understand. But devotees are never bewildered by these things, because those who are devotees, they understand the transcendental nature of the form of the Lord. And they know that the Lord is always present. All right, so we'll, we'll share this screen. Let me go to the text. Can you see the text okay? Yes? Yes, okay. So we're on text number 12. We finished 11. We're going to text number 12. Uh, the Lord appeared in the mortal world by in his internal potency, Yoga Maya. He came in his eternal form, which is just suitable for his pastimes. These pastimes were wonderful for everyone, even for those proud of their own opulence, including the Lord himself in his form as the Lord Vaikuntha. Thus, his, Sri Krishna's, transcendental body is the ornament of all ornaments. And so, the Lord is describing his transcendental, uh, Uddhava is describing the Lord's transcendental form, how the Lord comes in his, by his internal potency, right, the chit, chit shakti, and he appears in the most wonderful form, it's, it's very wonderful, the form, Krishna's form is just so attractive, but he comes, it, that he, he comes in a form which is suitable for his pastimes, so he doesn't come in a forearm form which is the form of Vaikuntha, the Lord of Vaikuntha. He has a forearm form. And so Krishna could have come in a forearm form, but he wouldn't be able to perform the pastimes which he wants to do. He wants to enjoy his pastimes with his loving devotees. Nanda Maharaj and Mother Yashoda, they want to, he wants to enjoy being their child. And if he has a forearm form, you know, could you imagine if you have a child with four arms? It would be very, very difficult. People would wonder, what kind of child is this? You have four arms. Your, your child has four arms. <laughs> so Krishna comes in a form which is suitable for his pastimes, which is a human-like form. Now, we should understand that the Lord, his form is the original form. It's not that God's form is made in the form of humans. Rather, we humans, we take our form from the Lord's form because we ourselves want to be like Krishna. So, it's, Prabhupada talks about anthropomorphism and zoomorphism, anthropomorphism, that we think God, we give a form to God according to the form of humans. But we should understand that we are made in this form because God has a form like this. So the original form of the Lord in his supreme abode in Goloka is the two-armed form. And we saw that also in the Bhagavad Gita, 
In the 11th chapter, you'll remember, in the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna wanted to see the universal form, and then he wanted to see the Lord in his forearm form. But he preferred to see the Lord in his two-arm form. It was the most pleasing, most satisfying. So here also, Lord Krishna's form, which is so wonderful that Uddhava said that uh, when he comes, he comes with all, all the opulences. And it said, even for those of their own opulence, including the Lord himself, in his form as the Lord of Vaikuntha, that they're, they're so amazed, they're so attracted by this. Can you think of a pastime where, some, where, the, where the Lord of Vaikuntha is attracted? to see the form of Lord Krishna? Uh, uh, Karnataka Sai Vishnu stealing the uh, sons of a Brahmana and then uh, having uh, Krishna and Arjuna come to his abode to get back the Brahmana's sons. Right. Yes, right. That comes in chapter, I think it's 89 in the 10th canto Srimad Bhagavatam. The Brahmana's sons who the wife, his wife was having a miscarriage every time and so he came to Dwarka to protest <laughs> and Arjuna vowed he would give up his life if he couldn't save the next child of the Brahmana's wife. And so again the ch Brahmana's wife had a miscarriage and so Arjuna was in trouble what to do. So Lord Krishna told him, you come with me. So Lord Krishna and Arjuna went together on, on Lord Krishna's chariot and they went through the coverings of the universe into the Kajal Ocean and they went to see Mahavishnu and Lord Mahavishnu was there and he told them that I took away these children because I wanted to see you. I just wanted to see. So this is the pastime that even Mahavishnu, he's the Lord of Vaikuntha, he wants to see the Lord himself. He that form of Lord Krishna in his original two-arm form is so pleasing that even Lord Mahavishnu desires to see it. All right, so, and, and the opulences of Lord Krishna are so wonderful that they bewilder even the mind of, of, of the Lord of Vaikuntha. The opulences are things like uh, Lord Krishna having 16,108 wives, you know, that's an inconceivable opulence even to the Lord Vaikuntha. So Lord Krishna is Bhagavan. He is the real Bhagavan. There are many people who also take the name Bhagavan, but who is actually Bhagavan? They have to have all of these opulences. So when Lord Krishna was, was present on the planet, he had all of these opulences greater than anybody else, and nobody could equal him. So, oh, and then one more point is made about the beauty of the Lord, that his beauty was, he was so attractive, so, so pleasing to everyone. So Jiva Goswami questions, he said, Maybe it's due to the ornaments, because Lord Krishna is decorated with so many nice or ornaments. But then the reply is given, no, get, as we see here in this verse, that Lord Krishna's transcendental body is the ornament of all ornaments. The ornaments which he wears become beautiful because they're on the body of Krishna. It's not that the ornaments on Krishna make his body beautiful, but rather Krishna makes the ornaments beautiful. So this is, these are some points from this verse. Uh, just to go through, you can see here, I've marked some of the significant parts of the purport, that he did not appear in human society in his Vaikuntha feature with four hands because that would have been, that would not have been suitable for his pastimes. 
But in spite of his appearing as a human being, no one was or is equal to him in any respect in any of the six different opulences. So Krishna is the Swayam Bhagavan, right? And then Prabhupada also talks about the Lord's pastimes, how sometimes they're manifest and sometimes not. When the Lord's pastimes are visible to the human eye, they are called prakat. And when they are not visible, they are called aprakat. Just like it's pointed out that the Lord is still present in Vrindavan. He never leaves Vrindavan. But sometimes he's prakat and other times he's aprakat. If we go to Vrindavan just now, his pastimes are not going on. He's aprakat. But he's there in Vrindavan. He's still there. And he's still also in Dwarka. He resides eternally. And just like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he's here in Mayapur. Om Vishnupad Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Thakur Prabhupada. He went out one evening in Mayapur, here in Mayapur, and he went out and he came back and he told the devotees, he said, I met Lord Chaitanya. He said, I met all the Sankirtan party. They were here, they were, they were doing Sankirtan. So those who are very elevated souls, they can see Krishna. We're, we, we're not so qualified. Sometimes Krishna shows himself and sometimes he doesn't. Okay, and then some other points here about Krishna's opulences. His body manifested in the material world is transcendental par excellence in the sense that his pastimes in the material, in the mortal world excel his mercy displayed in the Vaikuntha Lokas. In the Vaikuntha Lokas, the Lord is merciful towards the liberated or Nitya Mukta living entities. But in his pastimes in the mortal world, he is merciful even to the fallen souls who are Nitya Bada or conditioned forever. So this is a very amazing point about the, the, the nature of the Lord's pastimes. That he shows greater mercy when he's here in this world than he does in Vaikuntha Loka. In Vaikuntha Loka he's with all his pure devotees, but he doesn't give them the mercy which he gives here. And we know the Lord was merciful to so many Nitya Bhadas. And we'll hear as we go on about some of them. Then the six excellent opulences which are displayed in the mortal world by the agency of his internal potency, Yoga Maya, are rare even in the Vaikuntha Lokas. And then Prabhupada describes some of the opulences of the Lord. The excellence of his Rasa Leela at Vrindavan and his householder life with 16,000 wives is wonderful even for Narayan in Vaikuntha and is certainly so for other living entities within this mortal world. His pastimes are wonderful even for other incarnations of the Lord such as Sri Rama, Narsimha and Varaha. The, his opulence was so super excellent that his pastimes were adored even by the Lord of Vaikuntha, who is not different from Lord Krishna himself. So this is the wonder of Lord Krishna's pastimes. We are so fortunate that we can be on this earth planet where the Lord comes to perform his pastimes and to give his mercy to his to even the Nityabhadas, giving mercy even to the Nityabhadas 
Oh, it's such a great opportunity for us to take advantage of the mercy of the Lord. All right, so this chapter, this text number 12, we'll go ahead, text number 13. All the demigods from the upper, lower, and middle universal planetary systems assembled at the time, uh, uh, at the altar of the Rajasuya sacrifice performed by Maharaj Yudhisthira. After seeing the beautiful bodily features of Lord Krishna, they all contemplated that he was the ultimate dexterous creation of Brahma, the creator of human beings. So this is a mistake which they made, that uh, those people attending the Raja Suya sacrifice and even the demigods, the demigods were probably also there attending this sacrifice, that when they saw the form of Lord Krishna, it was so pleasing and so attractive that they thought, oh, Brahma, this must be the perfection of Lord Brahma's creation. <laughs> so, of course, this is wrong, right? What is the proper understanding? Is the body of Krishna a creation of Brahma? Brahma was created by Krishna. Yes, right. Brahma is created by Krishna. So, who, who creates Krishna's body? <laughs> Where does Krishna get the beautiful form from? Prabhupada in the purport gives the example, examples. He said, the most beautiful object in the material world, in, in, he talks about the blue lotus flower, very beautiful, the blue, lo the blue lotus. Or the full moon, we know, of course, uh, Purnima, like Sarat Purnima, very beautiful. The moon's very beautiful in the sky on these occasions. The full moon and the blue lotus, they're very beautiful. But Lord Krishna's beauty, his bodily features, they, he defeats even these things. And this was, this was agreed by the demigods in heaven. They all agreed that the body of Krishna, the form of Krishna, is just so attractive that we cannot even begin to conceive of how attractive it must be. Would you like to see the form of Krishna? Are you eager to see the form of Krishna? What's, yes, the, what's the qualification? Yes, right. I think that's right. And of course, we need also Krishna's mercy. By the mercy of Krishna, if he wants to show us. Okay, going ahead, text number 14. The damsels of Braja, after pastimes of laughing, humor and exchanges of glances were anguished when Krishna left them. They used to follow him with their eyes and thus they sat down with stunned intelligence and could not finish their household duties. So this is the loving relationship between the gopis and Krishna, that the gopis are so attracted to the form of Krishna that they can't take their eyes off of him. It is, here's a little note here from at the end of the purport. It is said in the revealed scriptures that Lord Krishna personally never goes beyond the boundary of Vrindavan. He remains there eternally because of the transcendental love of the inhabitants. Thus, even though he is not visible at present, he is not away from Vrindavan for a moment. Hmm. 
Just like Rasastala is there in Vrindavan. Nobody goes into Rasastala in the, in the night, right? And nobody goes in, nobody will stay there because they know Lord Krishna is there. Lord Krishna is going to come. He'll have Rasa Leela every night. The gopis in their spiritual forms. So Lord Krishna never leaves Vrindavan, but he's not visible. In the Krishna book, Srila Prabhupada describes it. It is said that Krishna hid himself within the hearts of the gopis. He hid himself within the hearts of the gopis. And the gopis there, eternally there in Vrindavan, and Krishna is also eternally there. He doesn't leave. So the, the Lord stays in these different holy places. And sometimes he manifests, sometimes not. Sometimes pra prakat and then aprakat. Just like clouds. Sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not. Okay, text number 15. The personality of Godhead, the all-compassionate controller of both the spiritual and material creations, is unborn. But when there is friction between his peaceful devotees and persons who are in the material modes of nature, he takes birth, just like fire accompanied by the Mahatattva. So Lord Krishna enjoys being with his devotees, peaceful devotees. Devotees are peaceful. But there are other persons who are influenced by the modes of nature. And sometimes there will be problems between the devotees and the non-devotees. And we see that. We see, uh, for even in the times of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, there was friction between the devotees and the non-devotees. And the Chankazi was going to stop the Sankirtan, and he even broke the Madanga drum. So then the Lord appeared as Lord Nasringadev, and he warned the Chankazi, don't you ever interfere with my devotees. Don't you ever break the drum of my devotees. So when there's friction between the devotees and the non-devotees, then uh, here Uddhava gives the example, he said, it's just like fire. You rub two pieces of dry wood together and you can get sparks and you can make a fire, ignite a fire. And so in the same way, uh, this, the Lord appears and he takes birth accompanied by the Mahatattva, just, or just like fire accompanied by the Mahatattva. So the same way when the Lord comes, he doesn't come alone. He comes with his entourage. When the king comes, the, the king doesn't come on his own. Before the king comes, first of all, the minister will come or some, you know, security will come. I was in our temple one time in London and uh, some big policemen came and they said, the, the king of Nepal wants to come to the temple here. <laughs> the king of Nepal. Yeah, the king of Nepal, they brought their child to London for an operation, for some surgery and they came to visit our temple. So before they came to the temple, first of all, the big policeman came and said, the king of Nepal is going to come here to your temple. So like that, in the same way, when Krishna comes, people come before and people will come with him and after him also. They're all coming to take part in Krishna's pastimes. That is prema madurya. Krishna enjoys the association of his devotees. So the Lord doesn't just come on his own. And he will come particular time. He will come to protect his devotees because the Lord does care. He cares about his devotees. 
And it's his mission. He told Arjuna, my devotees will never perish. So the Lord's always ready, willing to come, to look after the devotees. Prabhupada compares the Lord, he said, just like electricity. So friction between Kamsa and then on you have Kamsa who is like the Karmi or the, the non-devotee and you've got devotees like Vasudev and Ugrasena. So they're, they're always in fear of Kamsa. So the Lord comes to protect them. Okay, we'll go ahead. Text number 16. Uddhava is saying, When I think of Lord Krishna, how he was born in the prison house of Vasudev, although he is unborn, how he went away from his father's protection to Braja and lived there incognito out of fear of the enemy, and how Although unlimitedly powerful, he fled from Mathura in fear. All these bewildering incidents give me distress. All right. Can, can you understand Uddhava's point? Why is Uddhava bewildered by these incidents? And why does it give him distress? He's mentioned a number of different incidents, right? He was born in the prison house of Vasudev. Is that very pleasing to know? Is that bewildering? Why would it be bewildering that Krishna is born in the prison house of Vasudev? Yes? How such a powerful person uh, can uh, take birth in a prison house? Uh, he's so opulent and uh, very powerful. How he can take birth in a prison house? Right. Yes. We would think he's the Supreme Lord. He should appear in the palace or something. But he's appearing in the prison house. Although he is unborn, also another point that he takes birth, but he is unborn. So these contradictions in the scriptures are very bewildering for the non-devotees. And so when they read it, then what will they think? What will the non-devotee think when they read something that, oh, he takes birth, but he's unborn? So what will be their conclusion? The non-devotees, they will conclude. They will, be uh, they will be bewildered that he also took birth in jail and he also affected with karma like that they will think Maharaj. Yeah, they may think well, is bad karma. No, but the contradiction that he takes birth but he's unborn. So they may think that devotees are telling lies and they are not reliable, something like that they will think. Yeah, they may think this is just an, an imagination, this is just a story, there's some mythology, or it's not real, it's just some, you know, story we're, we're hearing, it doesn't really happen, how he could be unborn but he takes birth, how is it possible? And how does the devotee understand it? Devotee understands the Lord's inconceivable powers. Right. This is the point. Yes, the devotees understand. This is the achintya shakti, the inconceivable potency of the Lord, that he has inconceivable powers. Can you give some examples about inconceivable powers? Do, you, do, you see, do we see any achintya, any inconceivable powers in the world? In our experience, 
people would say, is it possible to have such inconceivable powers? Do, do you see things inconceivable? One thing we can see is uh, how Krishna stores gallons and gallons of water in the form of clouds that are floating in the air. Okay, the clouds carry so much water and they can float in the air. Yes, nice example Prabhu, thank you. Yes, very good. That the clouds are carrying so much water with them. How do they manage to stay up in the, in the, in the, in the, in the sky? Carrying so much heavy load of water. Nature's creation, Maharaj. Yes, G give me give, so. Give me some examples. Like the beautiful flowers, and each and everything that is a creation of the Lord is so beautiful. Yeah, but I want to hear. What are they? Tell me. Uh, Maharaj, uh, one thing is striking me is like our own body. Krishna gave the wonderful mechanism. We don't know how it is happening. We are we are uh, taking the prasad and how it is getting digested and how, again we are getting the strength. So okay. all these things are inconceivable to understand. Even though science is giving so many things, but minute level we are not able to understand. Mm -hmm. And the small significant soul is inside the body. It's so much he did. So it was so, every time if you think of it, we'll be like, oh. Okay, good, yes. Also, the, another example, the sun. The sun planet every day gives so much heat, so much energy. One second of sunlight can give so much energy. It could provide so much electricity for the whole world for many, many years. Just one moment of sunlight that's coming from the sun planet. Such inconceivable potency. And do we ever see a fire which never burns out? The sun, every day, it's giving heat and light. And we don't put any fuel on it, you know. We're not, usually we make a fire, we have to add more fuel. But there, every day the sun is shining, giving us heat and light, which are so important. So we see within the world there are many examples of inconceivable potency. And the Lord, the Supreme Lord, His form also is, is inconceivable. That although He's unborn, He appears to take birth. So this is bewildering. And then, then it's also described, He went away from His Father's protection to Braja and lived there incognito, out of fear of the enemy. Oh, was Krishna afraid of Kamsa? Ah, Krishna is the Supreme Lord. Fear personified is afraid of Krishna. Krishna is not afraid of it. But why is Krishna doing these things? Why did Krishna go to Braja? These are just pastimes for him, hmm? and he wants to give. These are just pastimes for him, and he wants to give uh, devotees uh, some uh, protection or assurance, something like that. Yes, he, Mother, he, uh, he was thinking that he is not. Able, they will be not able to protect me from Kamsa. So um, they thought that if he is away, he, they can. He can be protected from Kamsa like that. Mother they were came was there, so he met up on for some time. Yeah. Okay, yeah. But then Krishna also, he, wa he wants to go to Braja because he knows his devotees are there. Nanda and Yashoda are there. And they're always Krishna's parents. They're the ones always to bring up Krishna and to enjoy the childhood Leela with Lord Krishna. And so it appeared like, <laughs> you know, Vasudeva is afraid of Kamsa, but Krishna's not afraid of Kamsa. <laughs> So Vasudev, he's taking Krishna to Braja, and there Krishna can enjoy his wonderful Leela with all of his devotees who have taken birth there already. And then also it mentioned, and how, although, although minutely powerful, 
unlimitedly powerful, rather, how unlimitedly powerful he fled from Mathura in fear. <laughs> Krishna fled from Mathura in fear. All these bewildering things. Krishna fled from Mathura. Of course, Krishna didn't fl take, uh, run away from Mathura, but he moved the inhabitants of Mathura. He moved them to Dwarka for their protection. And Krishna came back on his own to face, to face uh, Kalayavana and to deal with these people. So all of these pastimes, they were bewildering to Uddhava. Okay. I just noted, to enact his transcendental pastimes, Krishna came for his pastimes, particularly he's coming as a son, as a son he's going to be the son of Vasudeva and Devaki and then Nanda and Yashoda, a rival, he, he will be rivaling people like Sishupal, different demons will come. They will be his rivals, they want to challenge him. There will be the, the wrestling match like Chanura, Mustika, these rivals. Or an object of enmity. Object of enmity was definitely that for Kamsa, the enemy of Krishna, because Kamsa understood this child was going to kill him. He plays the part so perfectly that even pure devotees like Uddhava are bewildered. <laughs> For example, Uddhava knew perfectly well Lord Sri Krishna is eternally existent and can neither die nor disappear for, a, for good. Yet he, lament, yet he lamented for Lord Krishna. So this is the loving relationship, Krishna and his devotees. Uddhava is in this, he has this prema bhakti, so he's just remembering all the pastimes of Krishna and he's feeling, oh, it's breaking his heart. Later on, towards the end of the purport, a pure devotee knows very well how it is possible for the Lord to adjust opposite, opposite things. But he laments for the non-believers who, not knowing the supreme glories of the Lord, think of him as imaginary simply because there are so many apparently contradictory statements in the scriptures. Yeah, there are contradictory statements, you know. Uh, in, when, you studied, when you studied Ishopanishad, you know that verse there, uh, that the Supreme Lord walks and he does not walk. He's far away, he's very near. He's within everything, he's outside of everything. <laughs> you know, it, so it, it's very bewildering sometimes. 13th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, there's also these kind of things. It's something like, like the Buddhists. The Buddhists are fond of these kind of things because they think it, it's all just imaginary. It doesn't have any real meaning. The Buddhists say that the sound of one hand clapping, <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. So they think it's imaginary. But we have to understand these things properly. Devotees can understand the inconceivable potency of Lord Krishna. Going ahead, text 17. Lord Krishna begged pardon from his parents for their, Krishna and Balaram's, inability to serve their feet due to being away from home because of great fear of Kamsa. He said, O oh mother, O oh father, please excuse us for this inability. All this behavior of the Lord gives me pain at heart. 
Why is there pain at heart for Uddhava? What's the problem? Why is he feeling so much pain at heart? Well, what's Krishna doing? He's begging pardon from his mother and father. And he said, we were unable to serve you because we were away from home. Krishna's apologizing. We were away, we were, because of fear of Kamsa, we were not able to serve you. Please excuse us for this. Was this Krishna's inability? Uddhava feels... He talks about the fear of Kamsa, which was not true. He was not afraid of Kamsa. So is Krishna telling a lie? No, he was, um, he was being very respectful towards his parents. Yes. Even if you're the Supreme Lord, you give respect to your mother and father. Even though he's the father of everyone, but, but because he comes in this world as the child of Vasudev and Devaki, so he's respectful to them, treats them like parents. So Uddhava, however, hearing of the Lord's submission before his devotees, this is painful to the heart of Uddhava, that because he knows Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Why, why does Krishna take this humble position? Yeah, he's their child, but Krishna takes pleasure in being subordinate to his devotees. He takes pleasure when Mother Yashoda picks up a stick and chases him. Although he appears crying and trembling, it, it's actually he's enjoying this pastime. He enjoys this pastime. He enjoys the chastisements of Nanda Maharaj. It's all pleasing to him. The Lord takes pleasure in being controlled by his devotees, by his pure devotees. Oh, we've marked a few sections here. Let's see. We'll go through this purport. Okay, so how was it possible that they, Krishna and Balaram, were afraid of Kamsa? Is there any contradiction in such statement? Vasudev, due to his great appreciation for Krishna, wanted to give him protection. He never thought that Krishna was the Supreme Lord and could protect himself. He thought of Krishna as his son. So that is Vatsalya Ras. Vasudev thinks of Krishna as his son. So the mother and father always think of the welfare of their child. They will want to protect their child. So Vasudev, as a dutiful father, was always thinking how to protect his father his child. And that was why Vasudev took Krishna over to the house of Nanda Maharaj and left him there. Vasudev was a great devotee of the Lord. He did not like to think that Krishna might be killed like his other children. Of course, Vasudev already had, uh, he'd seen six of his children killed by Kamsa so now he's got this wonderful child, Krishna has appeared to him, and he knows he's Lord Narayan, but still he's playing the part of his child. So Vasudev thinks how to protect him. He did not want to disturb the intense affection of Vasudev, and thus he agreed to be carried by his father to the house of Nanda and Yashoda. So this is Lord Krishna playing the part of a, an obedient child. Why? He doesn't want to disturb the devotion 
of Vasudev. Vasudev wants to protect him, so Krishna allows it. And Prabhupada describes another incident that when they were crossing the Yamuna, that somehow baby Krishna fell into the Yamuna. Krishna arranged that he fell into the Yamuna. And his father was frantic with fear. My child, my child. He was frantic. So this was all pleasing to Lord Krishna. Krishna was enjoying this loving care which he was getting from Vasudev. He enjoyed being taken care of by his pure devotees. So these pastimes are all for the pleasure of Krishna. Although it appeared painful to Uddhava, it was very pleasing to Krishna. Prabhupada writes more, Since Krishna is the Supreme Lord, he was never afraid of Kamsa. But to please his father, he agreed to be so. So Krishna appeared to be afraid. He was doing it to please his father. And the most brilliant part of his supreme character was, he begged pardon from his parents for being unable to serve them while absent from home because of fear of Kamsa. <laughs> so this is the wonder of Lord Krishna's pastimes. Krishna wanted to teach the atheists who do not accept the Supreme Fatherhood of God and they may learn from this action how much the Supreme Father has to be respected. Uddhava was simply struck with wonder by such glorious behavior of the Lord and he was very sorry that he was unable to go with him. What does he mean? Where was Krishna going? He was very sorry that he was unable to go with the Lord. Where did Krishna go? He finished up his past tense. Yes, finished his past tense, went back to Godhead. Okay, yes. Okay, so the chapter goes on. We hear about... Uh, Krishna, just by the movement of his eyebrows, he could, uh, he, he, he could give death blows to people. He was so powerful. And then we hear about Sishupala, who is also known as Chedi Raj, and how Sishupala was so envious and so spiteful towards Krishna, and so insulting and offensive. And so how did Krishna deal with him? What happened to Sishupal? Krishna Yes, Prabhu, what, what do you say? I said he chopped off Sishupal's head. Yeah, but what destination did he get? Merging into the body of the Lord. Well, yeah, into the effulgence. Not exactly into the body, but into the effulgence of the Lord, into the Brahma Jyoti. Right? He got destination into the Brahma Jyoti. So, impersonal liberation. So, Vidura was also present there, and Uddhava referred the incident to his memory. Vidura was also there at that time. Oh. So that, was that very wonderful that Sishupal should get impersonal liberation or was that a punishment? It's a punishment. Well... For devotees it's a punishment. Huh? For devotees it's a punishment. For devotees it's a punishment, right. Who else gets liberation into the Brahma Jyoti? Only the demons killed by Krishna go there? Is that a special place only for the demons? Impersonalists? Yeah, the impersonalists, the jnanis, the yogis, the impersonalists. 
they also desire to merge. They enter into the Brahma Jyoti fold. And they make great, great endeavors. It's very difficult for them to achieve that destination. But Sishupal got it. So was Sish, did Sishupal, when he was killed by Krishna, did he have a loving attitude when he was seeing Krishna kill him? Did he appreciate the beauty of Krishna? The soldiers who were killed on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, they were seeing Krishna. They were thinking Krishna is very beautiful. They were, although they were being killed by Krishna, still they appreciated the beauty of Krishna. So did Sishupal also appreciate that? Uh, no, no, he was offensive. Yeah, right. He was hateful. He hated Krishna. Why did he hate Krishna so much? What did Krishna do to him? Uh, Rukmini, he kidnapped Rukmini from his uh, marriage. He, he's about to marry Rukmini. Yeah, right. That was one thing. Yeah. And and there were other things. One thing. When he was, yes, Maharaji, go ahead, speak up. Uh, when he was born, he was told that he will be killed by Krishna. Okay. Was he, was he born in poverty or was he born in what kind of condition? He was, his, he was Krishna's cousin. So, was he born in opulence or poverty? He was, in, he was born in opulence. Yes, he was born in opulence. He had a lot of wealth. He had a lot of power. He was a great challenger to Krishna. Krishna was always more than him. But he was, you know, he was envious of Krishna. That Krishna had more strength. Krishna had more wealth. Krishna had more power. You know, he was always... And so it was very, very hard for Sishupal to accept that this Krishna always beats him and then he's going to marry Rukmini and Krishna comes and takes Rukmini. Oh, it was just unbearable for him. So he had great hate for Krishna. And so when it came to the Rajasuya sacrifice, then he stood up and he really blasphemed Krishna. So then Krishna killed him. So he got impersonal liberation. Then we hear about the soldiers at Kurukshetra. And they were seeing the lotus face of Krishna, so pleasing to the eyes. So they, got a, they didn't get impersonal liberation. They got to the abode of the Lord. So the soldiers on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, they got a different destination from Sishupal. Prabhupada notes in this purport, his annihilation of a person like Sishupal is as auspicious as his actions for the protection of the faithful. So Krishna killing Sishupal was auspicious, <laughs> Prabhupada said. Because why? Because everything Krishna does is absolute. We can't say, oh, it was bad, oh, he shouldn't have killed him. No, Krishna is absolute. Everything he does is absolute. It's, for, it's all good. We can't distinguish, oh, Krishna shouldn't have done this. No. The Lord is absolute. So even killing Sishupal, it was absolute. It was as good as his blessing the faithful. And then further on, Sishupal saw the Lord also, but he saw him as his enemy, and his love was not awakened. Therefore, Sishupal achieved oneness with the Lord by merging in the impersonal glare of his body called the Brahma Jyoti. So Sishupal didn't get the destination of these other Kshatriyas who were killed by Krishna. Then Prabhupada explains there are degrees of transcendental awakening. That there are different degrees. Not everybody gets the same destination. And he describes here, essentially there is no material difference between Goloka and Vaikuntha. But in the Vaikunthas, the Lord is served in unlimited opulence, whereas in Goloka, the Lord is served in natural affection. So we spoke about this briefly the other day. I was describing to you the difference between Goloka and Vaikuntha, like the difference between Vrindavan and Dwarka. Goloka is Vrindavan, Vaikuntha means Dwarka. In Dwarka, 
you know, just like it, uh, in, in our Iskon society, we have New Dwarka, Los Angeles, right? Los Angeles, New Dwarka, <laughs> right? And we have Vrindavan, New Vrindavan. The New Vrindavan is rural, farming community, simple. But New Dwarka is all opulence. So that's the difference between Vaikuntha and Goloka. Vaikuntha, where there is opulence, there will be more Aishwarya. There will be more distance between the people. Not so sweet, not so pleasing and friendly. But in Vrindavan, Madhurya, very pleasing, very sweet, very nice, pleasing, friendly relationships. So that is the difference between Dwarka and Vaikuntha. So some people, they go to Dwarka, they go to Vaikuntha, and that's Shantaras, predominantly Shantaras. But in Goloka Vrindavan, the rasa will be predominantly Madhurya. Very different. Okay, a, a little more from the purport there, text 20. The wa these warriors who appreciated the lotus feet of the Lord and saw his face at the front had their dormant love of God awakened and thus they were transferred at once to Vaikuntha Loka, not to the impersonal state of Brahma Jyoti as was Sishupal. Sishupal died without appreciating the Lord while others died with appreciation of the Lord. Both were transferred to the spiritual sky, but those who awakened to love of God were transferred to the planet of the transcendental sky. Okay, so it's very important for us to note here the differences here, different destinations and why why they achieve these different destinations. Going ahead, text 21. Lord Krishna is the Lord of all kinds of three. All kinds of threes. Right? All kinds of threes. What are these threes? These are mentioned in the purport. Right? The threes are three qualities of material nature, three worlds, three purushas, like that. So Krishna is the Lord of all kinds of threes and is independently supreme by achievement of all kinds of fortune. He is worshipped by the eternal maintainers of the creation who offer him the paraphernalia of worship by touching their millions of helmets to his feet. So the maintainers of the creation, meaning the, like the demigods, Brahma and these different people, they're all worshipping Lord Krishna. So Lord Krishna is supreme, he's above everyone. Each universe has manifestations of 504,000 Manus. How do, how do we come to that calculation? Anybody know? How many Manus? Each universe has manifestations of 504,000 Manus. How many Manus are there in a, in a Dev Brahma? Manus. How many Manus in a Dev Brahma? 14. How many? 14. 14. 14. So how do we get 504,000 Manus? Fourteen into uh, hundred years of um, Brahma. So be fourteen in one day of Brahma, and and then fourteen into three sixty-five to hundred times thirty, right? And then times twelve. But times if the one day of Brahma you've got fourteen manus, then you have to multiply by thirty to get one month. And then you have to multiply by 12 to get one year, and then you multiply by 100. Right? Understand? 
Yes, true. Then mention the different shaktis. He is the lord of three principal potencies. Chit shakti, maya shakti, tatasta shakti. Yeah? Chit shakti means the spiritual potency. The maya shakti means the material energy. And the tatasta shakti means the living entities. Going ahead, 22. O Vidura, does it not pain us, his servitors, when we remember that he, Lord Krishna, used to stand before King Ugrasena, who was sitting on the royal throne and used to submit explanations before him, saying, O oh my Lord, please let it be known to you. Right? Why does Uddhava say, does this not pain, pain us? Lord Krishna is saying to King Ugrasena, O oh my Lord, please let it be known to you. What's happening here? Why is Krishna, why is uh, Uddhava feeling pain? Yes? The Supreme Lord taking a subordinate position. Yes, the Supreme Lord is taking the subordinate position. Why? He loves to take subordinate position with his devotees, whoever are in the world. Yes, and this is his pleasure. He likes it. He likes being under the, and the, the playing the play. Is it playing a part? He's in acting. It's a drama. It's all for his pleasure. This is his Leela. He gets tired of sitting on the throne in Vaikuntha and being worshipped by everyone. And he likes to come and be with these devotees. And he likes to see how they care for him and how they, how they, how they just love him so much. It's more pure and natural. So Krishna's he, he, when, when after Krishna killed Kamsa, he put Ugrasena on the throne and then Krishna comes before Ugrasena and he speaks so humbly to him and respecting him. Ugrasena is also his devotee. Okay, then we come to text 23. Maharaj, uh, sorry, yes? Krishna Maharaj, question here. So, I mean, why would Vidura feel that it pains uh, his devotees when Lord takes such a position which gives him pleasure. Well, because Uddhav, first of all, Uddhav is a Dwarkavasi. So in Dwarka, the Lord is on the throne and he's worshipped, right? So here he's seeing Lord Krishna in a different mood. Here he's seeing Krishna playing the subordinate part. In Vaikuntha, Krishna is the Lord and everyone's at his feet. And Uddhava always respects Krishna like that. And Unava never sits on the same level. He worships Krishna with awe and reverence. He's, some friendship is there, but he's never over intimate with Krishna. He never thinks of himself as an equal to Krishna. Thank, thank you, Varsha. Okay, text 23. Everyone chant this verse. Let's chant together. Aho bakiyam stanakala kutam. Jagam saya payanad apya sadvi Labegatim datri uchitam tatunyam Kambadayalam sharanam brajena Very famous verse, very important verse, one you would like to remember, I hope. So Uddhava is describing the mercy of Lord Krishna. We heard how he gave mercy to Sishupal, but that mercy of Sishupal wasn't equal to the mercy which Putana got. And Putana, she's described Bucky. She's the sister of Bakasura. She's the sister of Bakasura and Agasura. Quite a family. You know, she comes from this terrible family. Bakasura, Agasura, they're her brothers. And here's Putana coming, and Kalakutam, she's got this uh, deadly poison, Stana, 
Stanakalakutam, she put this deadly poison on her breast and she's coming to kill Krishna. And Krishna is sucking her breast. And what does Krishna do? What position does he give her? Where does she go when she's killed? Uh, maiden. She was given position of mother. Mother Ishoda. Well, she's she's not equal to Mother Yashoda. Yes. Don't don't think she gets the position of like Mother Yashoda. She's not like Mother Yashoda. Servant, being servant of Mother Yashoda, not nurse, Maharaj. Nurse, nurse, right? She's a nurse. Yeah, she becomes a nurse in the spiritual world in Goloka. She gets to go into Goloka as a nurse. To be a nurse there, but not quite. On, couldn't be on the same level as Mother Yashoda, but she's there. She does get liberated to the spiritual world. Krishna is so merciful. What mercy! You can, we can never imagine that kind of mercy from anyone. That he takes uh, someone. So Prabhupada explains here at the end of the purport. The Lord accepts the least qualification of the living entity and awards him the highest reward. That is the standard of his character. Therefore, who but the Lord can be the ultimate shelter? Very wonderful description Prabhupada describes so wonderfully here. That the Lord accepts the least qualification and awards him the highest reward. So what was Putina's qualification? How was she qualified? Even though she wanted to kill uh, uh, child Krishna, uh, she gave her breast as a milk. Uh, so that is her uh, only qualification. And and sometime when first time Putana saw that maybe she thought uh, that what a beautiful child, let me have a child like this also, she might have thought. Uh, she thought somewhere I read Prabhupada Maharaj. Well, I never read anywhere like that, that she thought, let, when, she, when she saw Krishna, she thought this child could kill the whole universe. <laughs> she had some feeling of the power of Krishna. But we don't read anywhere that she wanted to have a child like that. Anyway, uh, well, another thing is she disguised herself like a gopi. She appears like a devotee because she comes dressed like a gopi. She's got, you know, the, just like a gopi. She, and she was appearing. She came in there and people in Braja and Nanda Maharaj's house, they saw her and they thought, oh, who is this gopi? We never saw her before. And she said, oh, I'm, I'm the wife of a brahmana in Mathura. And, well, you know, she, she was disguising herself, just like sometimes people dress up as devotees. They're not really devotees, they disguise themselves as devotees. So very good. <laughs> you like to be a devotee? Good, welcome. <laughs> be a dev so Putana comes and she's dressed like a gopi and she wants to nurse Krishna. She picks up Krishna and wants to nurse him. So that's good, yeah. So Krishna takes her back to Godhead, gives her the supreme abode. Okay, text 24, talking more about the demons. Uddhava says, these demons are more fortunate. They're more fortunate because they're able to, they're more fortunate than the devotees because when fighting with the Lord, they were able to see the Lord carried on the shoulders, carrying the wheel and weapon in his hand. So they were fighting Krishna face to face, so they could see the face of the Lord. So Uddhava says, they're more fortunate than me. Uddhava said, the Lord is all, I'm not going to be able to see the Lord. Why not? Why will Uddhava not see the face of the Lord? Because the Lord's already disappeared. He's already finished his pastimes. And Uddhava, that these demons who died in front of the Lord, they were so fortunate. Prabhupada writes, 
This salvation of the demons is not due to their being devotees of the Lord, but it is because of the Lord's causeless mercy. Anyone who is slightly in touch with the Lord, somehow or other, is greatly benefited, even to the point of salvation, due to the excellence of the Lord. So causeless mercy, they get liberated. Further on in the purport, Prabhupada said, the fact is that the devotees who are always engaged in, my, in, in the devotional service of the Lord, in transcendental love, are rewarded many hundreds and thousands of times more than the demons by being elevated to the spiritual planets where they remain with the Lord in eternal blissful existence. The demons and impersonalists are awarded the facility of merging in the Brahmajoyti effulgence of the Lord, whereas the devotees are admitted into the spiritual planets. So who's better off, the demons or the devotees? The devotees, Maharaj. Yeah, what about saying, he's saying the demons are more fortunate. Prabhupada's pointing out, actually, it's the, the, the devotees are more fortunate. This is just Uddhava's lamentation, that he's thinking like that, that these people were so fortunate. Okay, text 25, being prayed to by Brahma, Lord Krishna being prayed to by Brahma to bring welfare to the earth was begotten by Vasudeva in the womb of Devaki in the prison house of Kamsa. Okay, thereafter his father, being afraid of Kamsa, brought him to the cow pastures of Maharaj Nanda, and there he lived for eleven years like a covered flame with his elder brother Baladev. There's an important point here to be understood that Krishna stayed with Nanda Maharaj for eleven years, and it is said that during these eleven years Krishna fulfilled, he went through all the three different stages of uh, growing up, right? First of all, there's, uh, there's childhood, and then boyhood, and then, uh, not exact, what is it? Childhood, boyhood, youthhood. Uh, anyway, it's Kumar, Poganda, and then Kaishore three different stages of growing up. Now, usually for children, the first five years will be Komar. Komar means up to five years old. And then Poganda is from the fifth year up to the tenth year. And then Kaishor is from the tenth year up to the fifteenth year. So, when you complete the Kaishor, you should be fifteen. But we see in Lord Krishna's case, it was different. Lord Krishna was only three years and four months old when he finished the Kumar stage. So for, for the first three years and four months, he was the, in babyhood and he was just growing up there and playing in the yard. But then, Poganda stage, he takes the calves and he will go with the calves. And Lord Krishna began doing that from the age of three years and four months. And he did it for another three years and four months. That was six years and eight months. He was taking the calves. And then he became Kaishor. And he began to take the cows. Six years and eight months up to the age of ten. And by the age of ten, Krishna had completed the Kaishor. And this is pointed out in the commentaries by the Acharyas. That uh, so, Lord Krishna, for up to ten, by the age of ten, he'd already completed what most children would be fifteen, and so Krishna was living there in Mathura and uh, in Vrindavan rather, and he lived there for eleven years, and he was actually about ten years and eight months, I think, when he went to Mathura.
So Prabhupada mentions from the purport, in order to play the role of a child, he agreed to be carried by his father to the cow pastures of Nanda Maharaj because Vasudev was afraid of Kamsa. Nanda Maharaj was due to receive him as his child and Yashoda Mai was also to enjoy the childhood pastimes of the Lord and therefore to fulfill everyone's desires he was carried from Mathura to Vrindavan just after his appearance in the prison house of Kamsa. He lived there for 11 years and completed all his fascinating pastimes of childhood. Childhood means Komar, boyhood means Poganda, and adolescence means Kaishore with his elder brother, Lord Baladev, his first expansion. Vasudev's thought of protecting Krishna from the wrath of Kamsa is part of a transcendental relationship. The Lord enjoys more when someone takes him as his subordinate son who needs the protection of a father than he does when someone accepts him as the Supreme Lord. So, we may pray to Krishna for protection. Oh, I'm in danger. Oh, Krishna, help me, save me, help me. That is not so pleasing to Krishna as when Krishna sees the devotee try to protect Krishna and please Krishna and serve Krishna. So Krishna enjoys being subordinate. He is the father of everyone and he protects everyone. But when his devotee takes it for granted that the Lord is to be protected by the devotee's care, it is a transcendental joy for the Lord. Thus when Vasudev, out of fear of Kamsa, carried him to Vrindavan, the Lord enjoyed it. Otherwise, he had no fear from Kamsa or anyone else. Okay, going ahead, text 27, we hear about Krishna and he's surrounded by cower boys and calves and they go to the Yamuna and the beauty of Vrindavan forest, all the chirping birds, very, everything very nice. Okay, this is the beauty of the Vrindavan forest. Prabhupada in the purport points out about these people who are with Krishna in his pastimes. He said, these cowherd boys were great rishis and yogis in their previous birth. And after many such pious births, they gained association of the Lord. Right? There's that verse which comes in the 10th canto. The cowherd boys are described, Krita Punya Punja. They perform pious activities over many lifetimes to be able to be with Krishna. Then Prabhupada adds further on, down in the purport, all these trees, all the trees and birds and beasts were pious living entities born in the transcendental abode of Vrindavan just to give pleasure to the Lord and his eternal associates, the cowherd boys. It's described that the, the birds were like great sages who come there, who'd come there to be in Krishna's pastimes. So the birds were like great sages and the trees, all of the, even the trees are very special. They said Madhavendra Puri is a, is a, Kama, is a Kalpa Briksha tree in Krishna Leela. So great sages come as trees. And at the end of the purport, because the land is identical with the Lord, devotees like Uddhava and Vidura visited these places 5,000 years ago in order to have direct contact with the Lord. 
visible or not visible. Thousands of devotees of the Lord are still wandering in these sacred places of Vrindavan, and all of them are preparing themselves to go back home, back to Godhead. Thousands of devotees. So Prabhupada's describing Vrindavan to us, and then describes about how Lord Krishna would play the part of a child, sometimes laugh, sometimes cry, he wants something, he would cry. And we hear about the beauty of Lord Krishna's bulls and Krishna playing his flute, enlivening his followers, the cowherd boys. They would all be so attached to Krishna. These cowherd boys, remember, we said they were great rishis. So they came to be with Krishna in his pastimes and they, they loved Krishna so much. And then we hear about Kamsa, killing Kamsa, how Kamsa sent so many demons to try to kill Krishna. Prabhupada describes them as wizards, wizards, they had their mystic powers, they could take so many different forms, and Krishna killed them all as easily as a child would break dolls. Text 31. The inhabitants of Vrindavan were uh, in great difficulty because of Kaliya. All the water of the Yamuna had become poisoned and cows had died and even cowherd boys had died. And then Lord Krishna came and he dived into the water of the Yamuna and then he dealt with Kaliya and he sent Kaliya away. And after he sent Kaliya away, and he arranged that the water of the Yamuna would all be pure again. And the people of Vrindavan, they could enjoy drinking the water. Okay, next text, we hear about Nanda Maharaj worshipping Indra. And Lord Krishna doesn't want that. He's not happy to see Vrindavasis worship demigods. He wants that in Vrindavan there should be pure devotional service. And Lord Krishna also knows that Indra has become proud. And so he doesn't want demigods to become proud either. So he makes Indra humble. From the purport, we noted a sec one section here. But one who is devotee to the Supreme Lord has no need to appease the demigods. Worship of the demigods by common people is an arrangement for acknowledging the supremacy of the Supreme Lord, but it is not necessary. Hmm. We don't have to worship the demigods. And then about the Vaishyas, the Vaishyas are specifically advised to give protection to the cows and their pasturing grounds or agricultural land Instead of squandering their hard-earned money, that will satisfy the Lord. So that's an important instruction for people today. The Vaishyas making money, earning a lot of money, they should use that money, hard-earned money, for the worship of Lord Krishna. And that will be pleasing, that will be for their ultimate benefit. All right? And just one, a couple, two more texts we hear about uh, how Lord Krishna picked up the Govardhan hill, used it as an umbrella to protect all the cows and the inhabitants of Vrindavan from Indra's torrents of rain. And then the final text is about Rasalila. Lord Krishna calls all the cowherd girls to come. So when he was seven, he picked up the Govardhan hill and when he was eight, it was Rasalila. And at eleven, Krishna goes to Mathura. That was Krishna's childhood. So Unava has been narrating about Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan. So chapter three goes on to describe about the Lord's pastimes out of Vrindavan. Okay? So are there any questions? 
Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, actually, we heard that uh, uh, Jai Vijaya, they were cursed to take birth as uh, uh, enemies of the Lord for the three lifetimes. Now, this uh, our Shishupala and Dantavakra, they are the Jai Vijay. But uh, Shishupala, but Lord promised that they'll come back to Vaikuntha after the three lifetimes. But Sisupala, here it is mentioned that he got this uh, uh, Sai Jiva Mukti and uh, he merged with the Lord in uh, Brahma Jyoti. So how these two are uh, different probably, how to... Uh, but that, that merging, that merging into the Brahma Jyoti, that's only temporary. And from there, then he will be transferred to his place in the spiritual world. When the Lord goes back, when the Lord finishes his pastimes, at that time, then Sishupa will enter into his position in the spiritual world as he would again become a doorkeeper in Vaikuntha. Uh, Maharaj, one more question, Maharaj. Actually, before Lord leaving to uh, Goloka Vrindavan, it was mentioned that all the inhabitants of uh, Goloka and the Dwarakavasis, they were sent back to their respective places in uh, Vaikuntas and Goloka Vrindavan. But uh, Lord never leaves the Vrindavan means the Lord will be there with the devotees also. How to understand these two things, Prabhuji, uh, Maharaj? Yes, well, this, you know, the Lord in his original form is there in Goloka Vrindavan, but he expands himself. And so, the, so you've got Shamsundar Krishna in Vrindavan, and you've got Vasudev Krishna in Dwarka. Right? There's all Krishna, but different expansions is there. But the, originally Goloka Vrindavan, Krishna is always in Goloka Vrindavan, he never leaves there. But he expands himself for these pastimes. You know, somebody asked me in the last class about Brihaspati and uh, how Uddhava became a disciple of Brihaspati. So I tried to do some research on that, and I did get a quote, a little bit of a quote from His Holiness Bhakti Charu Swami Maharaj, that he'd lectured on something about this in Ujjain, when he was giving a Bhagavatam class in Ujjain, many years ago actually, we found the quote. But he said, what he said was, that when Uddhava was a young boy, he went to the ashram of Brihaspati and became his disciple. So I thought about it and thought, you know, it's reasonable because, remember, it's not Kali Yuga. And so Brihaspati, he could be, it could be here on this planet. He has an ashram here on this planet. Although he's the guru of the demigods, the demigods can come down here. The demigods come down here, but not in Kali Yuga. They don't come to this planet in Kali Yuga. But other Yugas, they will come here. So they could, they could have came, the Brihaspati had an ashram here and, Brih, and the demigods all came and took, shelf, took initiation from Brihaspati or took education from Brihaspati. Or, I don't know, maybe Brihaspati went there and taught them. But in Kali Yuga, of course, we don't have that kind of facility. But in other Yugas they do, they travel to these different places. But he did say like that. He said that Uddhava as a young child, he'd gone to Brihaspati's ashram and was educated there, became his disciple. Hare Krishna, thank you very much. Yes, any other questions? Perhaps can I ask you a question? Please. Maharaj, uh, you said about the different devotees, uh, different people going to different destinations, we service the soldiers, we service uh, Sishupala. Uh, I was just trying to understand how Duryodhana and Dushasana would have gone. They were envious and they were on the battlefield. Especially Duryodhana was very envious. So, do you think, uh, means, can you kindly let me understand? Yes. Well, what can we say? Definitely, he had some, some connection with the Lord there because he's coming in the Lord's pastimes. Maybe he's got some unpleasant role in the administration of the Lord. <laughs> you know, there, there has to be people like the personality of Kali and so on like that. 
you know, who's going to play all of these kind of parts for the Lord's pastimes. But we're, we're, I don't know, I, I wouldn't like to speculate, we're not told anything about it, but we're encouraged to start to think about the devotees, you know. Don't think about these demons. <laughs> think about the devotees. Think about the wonders of the devotees. We do hear, about, we heard about Putana today. She was so fortunate. So Dhritarashtra, Duryodhana, Dhritarashtra was fortunate also in some ways because definitely uh, he got Vidura guidance here at the end of his life. and He went off and achieved some kind of mystic perfection, impersonal liberation, and from there could go on to some other place. But we don't get, you know, we don't, we don't uh, spend a lot of time thinking about the destination of the demons. We want, sure. we want to meditate more on the, the, the devotees and their wonderful activities. Thank you, Maharaj. Um, Maharaj, actually I heard in Sarvabhoma Sangha, there is a lot of uh, Maharaj sessions. Actually, he mentioned Duryodhana is uh, one of the associates of uh, Sankarsana. When Balram want to join this Krishna's pastime, so he also want to join Balram. So he take the role. That's what uh, once I heard Maharaj. Oh, okay, interesting. Yeah, maybe certainly Duryodhana had a lot of association with Lord Balaram. Lord Balaram is Sankarshan, and so Duryodhana could be an, an associate with Sankarshan. And certainly Lord Balaram spent time there with Duryodhana. That's a good point. Thank you, Maharaji. Very nice. Yes? We have the darshan of our Lord's Narsips for you, Krishna. Oh, thank you. Jai Jagannath Baladev Subhadra Ki. We also have one. Vaman and Deva on our altar, Maharaj. Oh, really? Yes. And Maharaj, that's for you, the Chitari. Pujari is giving you the Chitari. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. So, uh, I think the only altar we have, Vaman Dev, because the legal office was there, so they had asked to keep a Vaman Dev on our altar, and we have. Who asked you to keep Vaman Dev on the altar? Um, it was uh, Shama Shundar Prabhu, or one of Prabhupada's disciples, he was an astrologer, and Bangalore has some legal issues. So he said Vaman Dev should be on the altar. <laughs> okay. So he's, he's, so he's here. He's mercifully staying with us. Ah. He's been here. Lord yeah. Vamana Dev is good for legal issues, is it? If we have some legal <laughs> so, problems. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe something. And then he, he stayed and the local GBCs have never um, asked us to move it out. So they stay, move him out. So he has been on the altar. Oh. Is that... Where Can you is, take to the Prabhu close by, please, so that Maharaj sees? Where is Lord Vamanadev? Um, yeah, he's just going nearby, Maharaj. Take it nearby, take it nearby, go on the altar, Achyutta. Yeah, he's... Maybe you can climb on the, you can go near the altar if possible. Yeah, you can go to Shuddha Nichan and Prabhu is there. Yes. Oh, here. Yeah, oh, just beside. Oh, I see. Oh, yeah. Oh, wonderful. Just beside um, uh, Lakshmi Narasimha Maharaj. Oh, this is Lakshmi Narasimha? Uh -huh. Yeah, that's Lakshmi Narasimha. And, and Prahlad. And Prahlad. And and just beside Lakshmi Devi is uh, Perla, is uh, Vaman Dev Maharaj. Oh, beside Lakshmi Devi is. Yeah, here. Just, just had just and build. That's the position he made for himself. <laughs> I see. Okay. Yeah. Very nice. Huh. Wow. Interesting. You're the only temple with Vamana Devi. <laughs> I never heard yes, any other yes, people having deities of Lord Vamanadev. Yeah, he's been there and I think. 
Is it helping you through all the legal problems? Oh, I, I, I think Maharaj, Bangalore is in a better place now than it was a decade back. So I hope it, him, he will come back. <laughs> yeah, legal problems can be a big headache, yeah? Yes. <laughs> I know Vrindavan had a lot of legal problems some years ago. I don't know now. Mm. India. <laughs> India, is, this is one of the things about India, everybody goes to court, they want to go to court, everything. Yeah, <laughs> the Lord is also dragged sometimes. <laughs> That's Nitai Chaitanya Maharaj. Oh, wonderful. Very nice. A lot of garlands there. Do you make all these garlands every day? Yes, mothers make the, there's a wonderful deity team. Even the dresses and the... Mm, Jewelry, everything is made in the temple by the Mataji's mm. Rajagopika and Rasika Saki Mataji, they lead the team. Wow. And this My is um, mm. Radha Krishna, Jadak Maharaj has named them um, Gaurangi Bangalore Ishwara. <laughs> Bangalore Ishwara? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Gaurangi. Okay, very wonderful, very beautiful to see so much nice worship. You're really fortunate. Such, I'm so. I, I hope we get your association soon, sometime when you come to Bangalore. Yes, I hope so. I look forward to that. I'm so fortunate to get darshan today. It's really very nice, very wonderful. Thank you. Srila Prabhupada can be so Achyuta Prabhu, maybe then. Oh, yes, one minute. Jai, Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Hi. <laughs> yeah, very nice. Prabhupada must be very happy there with your worship. Very, very, very nice. Very well done. Jai, Srila Prabhupada ki jai. I'm very happy and very, very grateful to you to give me darshan, see the deities. Very nice. Okay, so we will finish here today and we will meet next week and we'll go on to chapter 3 and we'll hear about Krishna's pastimes out of Vrindavan. Okay, thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Go, go back to Vrinda Ki. Hare Krishna.